Hello, everyone, and inside today's episode of Locked On Canadians, the Habs made a trade with the Chicago Blackhawks. Once again, the Laval Rocket lost another frustrating game, but I have the positives for you to take away from this and their start of the season. And is Yuri Slavkovsky nearing a return to the Canadians lineup? All that and more inside today's show. Locked On Canadians, your daily podcast on the Montreal Canadiens. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 714 of Lockdown Canadians. Uh, as you will notice today, I am flying solo. I am your host today at Scott Matla on Twitter. And as always, thank you for making Lockdown Canadians your first listen of the day. If you're listening to this wherever you get your podcasts or if you're watching my very tired, haggard face on YouTube, thank you for subscribing. Please make sure you ring the bell so you get notified every single time that we upload a brand new episode or go live on YouTube.com. And we're going to jump right into the news today because Kent Hughes remains a busy, 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 busy bee uh, to start the season today. And the biggest news is early this morning, uh, the Montreal Canadiens announced they had traded forward Cam Hillis, who is currently playing with the Lions in the ECHL for defenseman uh, Nicholas Baudin. Baudin, Baudouin, I am not 100% sure on that, please correct me if it is uh, Baudouin or Bowden. I am not 100% uh, sure on that, to be honest, um, today. And for what it's worth, first round, 27th overall pick in 2018 by the Blackhawks. He fits a need in that the Rocket needed another guy with the Laval Rocket. As of right now, uh, Baudouin is playing with the Rockford Ice Hogs. He's played three games for them. He is expected to join the Rocket at the end of the week, which is good. They have two games against the Rochester Americans Friday and Saturday. He will be much needed there uh, for today. The Canadians also seceded Corey uh, Schooneman down to the rocket. I think just to kind of cover just depending on travel, this or that. My first look at this, I look at Baudouin as someone who is very good at producing points at the QMJHL level and the CHL level. He was at or near a point per game pace in his uh, full regular seasons uh, with Drummondville, the Voltagers in the QMJHL. He had seasons of 41, 69, nice, and 56 points before turning pro. And he's primarily been an AHL piece for the Chicago Blackhawks. Played one game in his first year while playing 59 games for the Rockford Ice Hogs, where he had 15 points. He then the next year played 19 games for the Chicago Blackhawks, six points in those 19 games and had 10 points in nine games for the Rockford Ice Hogs in that. Played at the World Cup of Hockey for them, registered one assist in 10 games. Played two games for the Blackhawks last year, 66 games for the Ice Hogs with 16 points in those games. And then he's just played three games for the Ice Hogs so far this year with one assist, two penalty minutes, and a minus one. Uh, My first thought on this is it makes sense. Cam Hillis was not going to be a guy that was going to crack the Canadians lineup unless everyone got COVID again. And I was someone who really liked Cam Hillis. He and Alan McShane out of that uh, Canadians draft class were two guys that I really liked uh, when they were picked and then they hit the pro level, or at least Cam Hillis did. And there wasn't a big amount of growth on top of that, which is unfortunate because I think he had all the talent in the world to do that. It just didn't come off that way. And in Chicago, and particularly with Rockford, he's going to have a better shot at trying to crack the NHL because the one thing the Canadians do have right now is a full uh, core of forwards right now. And there's guys that should be playing in the professional ranks, like a Philip Machar, who are in the OHL because it is so full and they were not guaranteed that time. And there's a backup for the Rocket in the forward group, Brendan Sonia. Peter Abandonado, Pierre Dubé, uh, Brett Stapley, Ryan Francis are guys who are playing in the ECHL because there was no guaranteed space for them with the Rocket this season. And I didn't think Hillis was going to be cracking that lineup. So it's a it's a fresh start for both guys. But my first thought is I look at this and I go, a guy who's maybe not performing up to what his junior numbers are, playing mostly in the AHL, probably should be in the NHL at some point. Former first-round pick, from Quebec that the Chicago Blackhawks seem to be selling very low on. 
If this sounds familiar to anybody, it's because it reminds me a lot of what the Philip Deneau trade was. Maybe not to the same extent. I don't expect uh, uh, Nicholas Bodin here to become a top pairing NHL defenseman or even you know a top three defenseman on this team. I think he's someone that they might slot in on that third pairing. I think he creates uh, some offense as a power play option for them. And I think he's going to be a good fit with the Rocket who need – Something new back there, and we will talk about them and their game against the Belleville Senators in our next segment here. But I'm a big fan of what this means, and I think now this should assuage some fans' fears of Arbor Jack I potentially going down to the AHL right now. I don't think that's going to be the case. Uh, they're both left-shot defensemen. I don't see that being what uh, Kent Hughes and the Habs want to do right now, at least not until Joel Edmondson is healthy, and that's the big question. Uh, Edmondson and Armia are traveling with the team. Chris Weidman and Josh Anderson missed practice the other day. We're going to get more into uh, potential injuries and stuff towards the end of the show here, but Joel Edmondson's on the fringe of being ready. They're going to have to send guys down and having a guy like Bodan that in case God forbid, someone just gets claimed on waivers. Uh, not that they have a lot of options for guys who would go down on waivers, but they have an option there in case they need it. And it's an extra body. And in the season the Canadians are having, it makes sense that they would take this. It's extremely low risk and potential. It's not going to be a high reward. This is not going to turn into some superstar. It might. That'd be awesome if it did. Huge Kent Hughes W for that. But it's just a nice low risk mid-tier reward if everything goes the way that it should be for this. So I'm not, I'm not predicting big things, but my confusion is why Chicago – was so happy to pull the trigger on this. Yes, they've been off to a much better start than many expected, but many expected them to do nothing but, you know, burst into flames and fall over on the floor. I can't believe that they didn't have room to at least give him a shot this season. The defense isn't that good that it needed to trade away a young defenseman who's in the final year of his entry-level deal, so it's going to be up to him to try and earn another contract with the Canadians here, but... I, I like Kent Hughes taking this risk. It's obviously not a huge risk, but it helps improve the rocket. And then they also completed another trade at the ECHL level. Riley McKay is going to join the Lions. Uh, he had 192 penalty minutes last year in the ECHL. That should tell you a lot of what you need to know about that. Trades for future considerations, so there's nothing really else going on there. And this was also coupled with Chicago trading Evan Barrett from the Rockford Ice Hogs to the Lehigh Valley Phantoms. It was an NHL trade because he's not on an AHL deal but I'm very confused what Chicago is doing just continuing to sell off young assets on their team but it's to the benefit of everyone else and that's uh, not really my problem and speaking of young prospects the AHL and all that other stuff happening right now the Rocket played a very frustrating game against the Belleville Senators on Wednesday night I just got done watching that I'm going to have your recap talk a little bit about Matthias Norlin during the Rocket and that's all coming up next but first, today's show, as always, is brought to you by BetOnline.net. They're your number one source for all your betting needs, from football to the World Series to the sport of hockey to everything else that is coming up. you got to check out BetOnline. They have all the latest developments, news, lineups, everything you need all in one spot. And they have up-to-the-minute scores and live betting on everything. So if you want to check out World Series betting, NFL, NCAA, boxing, golf, Bet online has you covered. So head to their website today to learn more. And remember, bet online, it's where the game starts. And as always, thanks for making us your first listen of the day here at Lockdown Canadian. So make sure you're also checking out Lockdown Sports today. From the games that matter the most to the biggest stories in sports, go beyond the scoreboard and behind the scenes with local experts and insights that only Lockdown can provide. You can get Locked On Sports Today available on whatever app you listen to your podcast, YouTube, or wherever else. So, as many of you know, I spend most of my time covering the Laval Rocket for Habs Eyes on the Prize in addition to doing, you know, other stuff post-game and whatnot. And they've had a very frustrating start to the season. In six games, they are 1-4-1. One, and one. The one game that they won was a 2 nothing shutout that required Caden Primo to make nearly 40 saves and required an empty net goal in the final minute to seal the win for them. And tonight against the Belleville senators, they had one of their most frustrating contests that I can remember in recent memory. 
they were at one point in this game out shooting the Senators two to one and losing one nothing. And we're going to clear the air on this. The officiating in this game was bad across the board to the point that Rocket Captain Alex Belzio says, I don't have much to say about this. Corey Schoenman said it was a mess out there at times. I'm not going to blame the officials for the Rocket losing. In this game, though, they tied it up, took the lead on a really nice play from Brandon Giniak, and then took a double minor for high sticking and then closed their hand on the puck, gave up a five-on-three goal, not great, but were eight seconds from getting to overtime and getting a point out of this when they were up against the wall late in the game. Rourke Charche goes unchecked in front of the net, fires one shot that Primo saves. As Primo goes to reset, Charche is allowed to get his own rebound, slots at home with eight seconds left, and the Rocket snatched defeat from the jaws of victory in this game. And a lot of people are going to look at this and go, Matthias Norlinder's slashing penalty towards the end of the game on the power play is what's going to... Uh, stand out here and ca- and be the thing that cost the team in this game. And my thought with that is, yes, Norlinder made a mistake playing the puck in that. He's also been the Rockets' best defenseman so far this season. He's a completely different player overall in that I see him being more confident, making assertive plays. His defensive game is still a work in progress but I've seen it grow leaps and bounds from where he was at last season where asking him to play defense was a struggle at times. He's much more competent and a much more composed player back there. And I'm seeing him make plays that you want to see someone like him make good passes, aggressive passes, high danger passes, putting the puck on net in a way that creates rebounds or chances for tips, deflections, whatever. His one error should not overshadow the rest of the work he's done this year. And I think what's really bugging the Rocket right now is a lot of these guys that they have here. Anthony Richard has a pair of goals. Brendan Giniak has a pair of goals. Gabriel Bork has four goals. Alex Belzeal has a goal. Jesse Ullinen has, you know, a goal. They're waiting for more of their reliable pieces from last year to kick in. jean Sebastian D is gone. He's in Arizona right now. They don't have a ready-made replacement for that top-line center spot. And ironically, with Philip Mashar going back to the OHL and how talented that top line is offensively with puck possession and the way that they play the game, I almost think Mashar would have been a really nice fit between Raphael Harvey Pinard and Jesse Ullinen on that top line. And unfortunately, you know, he is not here. There's not anything you can do about that. The veterans that they need to step up haven't hit in a way they need to. Donick Martel was a healthy scratch tonight, and that's fair. He hasn't played exceedingly well this year. Joel Teasdale doesn't have, you know, the points that he needs in this game. Nate Schnarr, not a big offensive guy. He was a good player with the Utica uh, Comets, but he was playing on one of the most high-powered offenses in the AHL at the time. He settled nicely into his role of being a really good two-way center. There's some offense coming out of that. I've really liked what Jan Meshack has brought to the table, but the points just aren't there. And it's not because the team isn't getting shots. They generate shots and chances. The finish and skill that they had in some certain cases last year is lacking a little bit in this season. This game's frustrating to me because they had every opportunity to put it away. Very early, they were out shooting them. I think it was like 13 to three at one point in the first period. Yes, Kevin Mandelazzi was making a lot of very good saves, and all credit to him. He was very good in net, but there are chances that they should have buried. Mitchell Stevens had an empty net, hit the post, and then fanned on the rebound. Jan Meshack and Brendan Jiniak had a two-on-one, or two-on-nothing, where Meshack pushed one wide of the net. The opportunities are there. It's just the finish is not where this team needs it to be, and I don't think Caden Primo has been exceedingly bad he hasn't been like peak like he was in the playoffs but I think he's been a lot better in his game so far this year he's just not hitting the same peaks he did last year the penalty kill despite giving up two power play goals Sunday's the only reason why this game probably wasn't even worse for the rocket their power play struggled a little bit yeah they got a power play goal out of it but it's struggling and that seems to be a theme in the Canadians organization right now I'm not going to panic six games into the season, but they got to find something that works. And I'd like to see them move Mitchell Stevens up to the top line, drop Alex Belzeal down the line, you know, put him back with Donick Martell and Brandon Jiniak and let that ride. 
and see what some of these other guys can do. I wouldn't mind seeing Peter Abandonado back in the lineup. I'd like to see Brennan Sonier play a game just because I think it's a different look into this lineup. I'm excited to see Bodan join the lineup later on this week. I assume Corey Schooneman will probably be called back up to the Canadians at some point. Um, there, it, it, You can't pull the plug six games in, but it's been a frustrating six games. There are games in every single one for the most part that they were in until just suddenly they weren't or they shot themselves in the foot uh, going through it. I think there's plenty of time for them to turn this around, but they need that kind of spark. The shots are there. The possession is there. The counterattacking is all there. It's just there's no bounces. And sometimes that's just the game. I do think it'll get better. They're not going to play the Senators every single game, and they always play poorly against the Senators. The Amherst are going to be an interesting test. They're a very dangerous team. They're a young team, a lot like some of the players on the Rocket are here. And JF Hool's got, you know, some thinking to do here. He's got to, you know, get this ship back on ship. I did say ship back on track here. And I think they can do that. It's just, you know, everyone needs to compose themselves a little bit and not worry about, you know, next game, next week, shift by shift, play by play and make it happen. Uh, speaking of the rocket guys coming up or speaking of the Canadians and guys coming up and down from the NHL, we have news ahead of the team traveling to Buffalo, which I believe they did earlier today on Wednesday. We're going to get into what that good news might be and more all coming up next. We are back here at Locked On Canadians. I am flying solo tonight. I uh, gave Laura the night off. She had some family stuff going on. I said, don't worry about it. I've got the show covered tonight. Go relax. Hang out with your family and whatnot. You've had a busy week. So you were stuck with me tonight, unfortunately. And I, of course, am in Buffalo, New York. You know who else is in Buffalo, New York right now? Uh, the Montreal Canadiens are in Buffalo, New York right now, or at least I assume they will be in short order here. They played the Buffalo Sabres on Thursday when you were listening to this podcast. And what we know about this game is I could preview it. And I'm going to say one thing. It's going to be frustrating. It's going to be dumb because every Canadians game they play in Buffalo is frustrating and dumb. They could play great and they will still give up four goals against. They could play crappy and give up four goals against. Buffalo is just that kryptonite team for the Canadians that I will never, ever truly understand, which, you know, is fine. There was some good news from practice before uh, they left. Uri Slavkovsky was back at Canadians practice today. And they said, you know, he should be ready to go by the end of the week. I am curious to see now if he's going to be in the lineup on Thursday night. I think his brand of offense would be a needed boost for this Canadians team here. I think he would add a nice presence on either power play unit to help sort that out. And I think based on the way the Sabres defense is with Rasmus Dahlin and Owen Power, having a guy like Uri Slavkovsky out there, in addition to Josh Anderson, if he is healthy and good to go, because he missed practice today, uh, Kirby Doc and other guys out there, I think he adds a nice element that keeps them on their heels because the Sabres offense scoring at about four goals a pace, they played a very tough opening schedule, ended up with a winning, I believe they're four and two, coming back into Buffalo for this, and they're looking real good, but a lot like the Minnesota Wild, they are a vulnerable team. They generate offense incredibly. J.J. Paterka, Alex Tuck, and these guys have played really well for the Sabres to start this season, and that's and we saw Paterka play the Rocket in the playoffs last year. At least I did. He's very, very good. My question is, can they slow that down enough to kind of expose the Sabres' deficiencies, which are their defense isn't great the canadians is not elite by any means either i would never accuse the canadians of having a better defense than anyone else in the nhl at this point right now except maybe chicago and arizona but that's besides the point they're gonna have to be on their toes guys like jonathan kovacevic who have gotten caught flat-footed and arbor jack who tends to play aggressive sometimes and gets himself in the wrong spots are going to have to be on their toes in this game here and I think it's a very good test because I mentioned it in the show with Laura. These are two teams that are on the same path with the Sabres being a little bit higher and the Habs kind of being where the Sabres were a couple years ago. And I'm hoping that if Slavkovsky is good to go, this is a perfect game for him where the offense should be opened up a little bit and it allow him to use his creativity to create chances here. 
And I don't think, you know, unless, you know, both Chris Weidman and Josh Anderson are out, I don't think we're going to see any movement between the NHL and the AHL. I admittedly have not checked Twitter after the game to see if anything else has happened. I'm not expecting anything. I'm just very curious to see what the, you know, Canadians game plan is coming into this. And I'm going to, I want to take a look at what the Sabres lines look like. Cause I should know. And I don't off the top of my head, unfortunately, because I am sometimes not always the best at doing show prep, but let's take a look here. Daily face off Buffalo Sabres, Jeff Skinner, Tage Thompson, Alex Tuck dangerous. Jeff Skinner loves to play the Montreal Canadians and Tage Thompson and Alex Tuck are extremely good players. Rasmus Asplund, Casey Middlestat, Victor Olofsson, a little more offensively inclined. Don't give Olofsson space to shoot on the power play. Vinny Henestroza, Dylan Cousins, J.J. Paterka, Jack Quinn, Zemgis Gergensen's Kyle Pozo. They, and then defense, Darlene Labuchkin, Owen Power, Jacob Bryson, Lawrence Pilot, and Kale Clegg. There are opportunities for the Canadians to exploit this lineup. One, stay out of the box. Do not give... They can do not give the Sabres chances on the power play. They're going to be better than you are there. And then goalies, Eric Comrie and Craig Anderson. I ha- have a feeling that if it's Craig Anderson starting in net, and I assume Samuel Montembeau will probably get the start for the Canadians since Jake Allen has played the last few. It's going to be an interesting game. This could be high scoring across the board. And I think the opportunities are there for the Canadians to get favorable matchups. If they can slow down, Tage Thompson's line with someone like Christian Dvorak and Brendan Gallagher, or even a fourth line a little bit. And it opens up chances against Hinnestroza and Cousins and Kyle Pozo and Jack Quinn. They can make things happen here. They got to stay out of the box though. And if he's not ready, do you change things around a little bit? Do you give Michael Pozzetta a game where his energy might be needed to kind of keep these teams pushed back a little bit? Do you try and tweak the power play? We talked about Arbor Jack eye on the power play a little bit. If Chris Weidman can't go, you can slide Caden Gooley or Jordan Harris into that first unit and I think be better off for it. I want to see Arbor Jack eye get a shot on the power play for the Canadians. His shot's heavy. He can shoot the puck and I don't see why they won't why they won't, you know, give that an opportunity. You know, when you're listening to this, please drop your predictions. Tweet us at LO underscore Canadians. It is also going to be our mailbag on Thursday. Laura will be back for that. So please tweet us your mailbag questions as well. Uh, sorry for a little bit shorter episode. It's been a long day, uh, obviously doing this right after the Rocket game. If you have any other Rocket questions, you can tweet me at Scott Matla. I do my best to try and answer those throughout the day while I am at work. Please make sure you're following the podcast wherever you get them. Please follow my co-host at The Active Stick. And everyone, we will be live after the, well, not live, but we will be recording an episode after the Habs Sabres game on Thursday with the mailbag. And then we will be back with our three up and three down for Monday like we always are. So please, mailbag questions at LO underscore Canadians. Send them to LockedOnCanadiansGML.com if they're going to be a little bit longer. And when you're done checking us out, please check out Locked On Sports today. Available on YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. They have all the breaking news across any sports and all the analysis you can only get from Locked On hosts. Folks, we will see you all next time.